important to put this disclaimer up. And I'm going to start by saying uh, good evening and welcome to our webinar. Before we begin, we'd like to mention that this video content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The video content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. And our webinar tonight is Begin Your Weight Loss Journey Safely at Home. We appreciate everyone out there who's joined us, especially our panel here. We're very excited to talk about this topic and how you at home can safely begin your weight loss journey without leaving your home through telemedicine. So we have some very exciting information to get to and uh, a little bit about background of Brown Surgical Associates. They are hosting this webinar and Brown Surgical Associates is the area's largest surgical group with affiliations at most of the hospitals in Rhode Island and several in Massachusetts. All surgeons at Brown Surgical are on the faculty of the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. It should be noted that many of our surgeons are still handling emergency surgeries and many are right now on the front lines fighting the battle with COVID-19. Our thoughts and uh, tonight are going out to them, to all the first responders who are taking care of patients at this time. So tonight we will be discussing bariatric or weight loss surgery. We have a great panel to discuss beginning your weight loss journey from home. Times have changed in the last two months and the bariatric team at Brown Surgical has adapted. Joining us is the director of the Center of Bariatric Surgery at Brown Surgical Associates and the Miriam Hospital, professor of surgery at the Warren Albert Medical School, Dr. Siva Vithyanathan. Also with us is Dr. Todd Stafford, also from the general, a general surgeon and a bariatric surgeon at Brown Surgical Associates and an associate professor of the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. We're also thrilled to have our patient, Lynn. We met Lynn a few years ago, and a lot of you have probably seen her video online. She's a nurse, a teacher, and a married mother of two. It's a National Nurses Day, so we also say thank you to Lynn and to all those nurses you've touched and taught over the years. So Lynn is a new mother, sort of new mother, a couple of years ago, but for the second time, and she's got an amazing story that uh, we can't wait to tell and she'll be answering your questions in a little bit. But first we take a brief run through bariatric surgery, some of the options, and then we'll get to Lynn's story. So fear of bariatric surgery. Dr. Vithyanathan, we'd like you to take us through this first slide and explain what, what all these things mean and what is some of the fear. I think a lot of us uh, have seen uh, patients in the office who have been struggling with weight and it is not a you know, a recent event. Most people have been struggling for their entire lives or since their pregnancy or some life event that caused them to not exercise. And, you know, most of our patients have tried everything. And some of the fears of having surgery is some of the things that they hear, you know, people say it's a quick fix or a cop out or easy way out. And, you know, truth is actually it is not a quick fizz. It's not a cop out. You know, you really need to work hard, even with surgery for the rest of your life to actually keep your weight down. You know, the, the myth is that, <clears throat> that they all gain their weight back. And the truth is that even after 10 years, after bariatric surgery, at least 50% of the excess weight loss is kept off. Uh, it is not a lazy man's treatment. You know, this is uh, motivated patients who come in wanting to change their lives, but want a tool to help them to get their goal. And in order to do that, really work hard. And you know, most of our patients have significant metabolic conditions such as diabetes or hypertension or sleep apnea. All of this is a big obstacle for them to go about their day-to-day -day life. So they really want something that they can help uh, to overcome these uh, struggle. And bariatric surgery is, is uh, the one that helps you. And it is far from the truth to say, you know, that bariatric surgery is, is actually not, uh, is a quick fix. It is uh, the opposite. And there's always these fears that people being dependent. If you give up food, then you're going to be dependent on other things. And, you know, with a program like what we have at Brown Surgical Associates and at Miriam, 
we really work together to sort of help patients overcome these fears and really show them what the reality of bariatric surgery is. You mentioned myth versus reality. Dr. Stafford, we'll go ahead to bariatric surgery. Some of the myths versus reality. Talk about what some of these numbers are yeah. and what they mean. There are a lot of misconceptions about bariatric surgery. And um, the, really, the undeniable thing about bariatric surgery is people lose weight um, and get rid of a lot of their medical conditions with far more success than just diet and exercise alone. And diet and exercise are a huge portion of the process after bariatric surgery. But with this extra tool, it's just far more effective. So the weight loss, we're seeing on average 40 to 80% of excess weight loss. Um, and that varies slightly between the different procedures. And we'll be happy to talk about that in the office. Um, in addition to the weight loss, there's a big impact on weight-related medical problems. So diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, and even some things that people don't necessarily think of as being weight-related, like asthma or reflux. We're seeing um, a whole host of problems have improvement or resolution completely. So we can have a person coming in on multiple medications, and then after losing weight, really be able to get off uh, potentially even all of their medications. Um, but it does take hard work on the part of the patient. Dr. Fithianathan, anything to add to this one? Yeah, I think uh, like Dr. Stafford was saying, there are other things, you know, simple things like tying your shoelaces, uh, wearing a, 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 a pants or a dress that you can buy off the shelf. These are things that our patients struggle with. So having, be, being able to do that and uh, seeing that your weight loss is sustained. You know, we have been on, all oh, been on diets that it works for a short time. And bariatric surgery is the only thing that's out there that would, you know, consistently make you lose weight long-term and keep that off. So you can actually try to lead a normal life. Now there's another fear, a fear with the surgery. And the risk of death, there's, there's risk with any surgery, but explain, Dr. Stafford, explain what this, these statistics mean, please. Yeah, there, I, having surgery, there's fear surrounding it. And um, it could be a simple complication such as infection, but the ultimate complication is death. And people worry about, oh, what if I have this surgery and then I die trying to get myself better? But the reality is there's actually a much higher chance of dying just living with obesity than there is with undergoing the surgery. Um, when the death rates have been compared between different operations, it's really on par with getting your gallbladder out laparoscopically. So a lot has been done through the years to bring down that death rate um, to a point that's it's really a quite safe procedure. I think people think about obesity in the society as a behavioral failure, right? No one really thinks about, not no one, you know, many people attribute obesity as laziness or uh, behavioral failure. And therefore, you know, they should really try stronger. You know, they, they have to really try hard to lose weight. You know, the truth is it is a medical condition, you know? So like any other medical condition, Bariatric surgery is, is a surgical treatment for this medical condition. So I think, I think that is one of the things that I think people have to understand. And uh, when they really embrace that, uh, I think they see the results. And it, it is a safe operation. And, and doctor, tell us about uh, the types of surgery. Gastric bypass is what we see up here. Explain that yeah. to us. So I mean, there are two uh, major operations that we now uh, offer to our patients. The gastric bypass, is, a, is an operation that uh, the surgical um, uh, surgeons have the most experience with, uh, someone like me who has been practicing for 20 years. Uh, and I, it has been and true and tested. It has been out there for 50 years. We know the complication. We know what, how it works. And it limits how much you eat and also causes certain 
uh, food and vitamins not to absorb. So thereby limiting the amount of calorie that you eat and absorb. Uh, in this operation, the stomach is divided into a smaller pouch and the rest of the stomach, 90% of the stomach is bypassed. And not only this uh, stomach, but the first part of the intestines also bypassed. So when you do this, the, we are not removing any parts of your stomach or intestine. We're just redirecting the stomach and intestine. And we are using your digestive juices downstream where it's attached. This operation, like the bio sleeve, is offered to anyone who might qualify for surgery, but we tend to really like this operation for someone who is struggling with diabetes or reflux because it, you know, it's a remarkable operation for di diabetics. We often see you know, overnight uh, the improvement in diabetes and people coming off medication. This is like the joy of uh, doing this operation for me personally to see uh, diabetics really get much better right away. And the downside of this operation is that because of the malabsorption, you really have to be careful about vitamins. And certain vitamins are not absorbed as well. So this is a uh, <clears throat> operation that requires very careful monitoring of vitamins and intake. Uh, and this is, in terms of weight loss, this is an operation that allows you to lose about 60 to 80% of the excess weight. So what that means is if you're 100 pounds overweight, you can lose six to 80 pounds. So um, that's how the operation works here. Dr. Stafford, explain the sleeve gastric to me. Yeah, with the sleeve, you're essentially just making the stomach much smaller. So you, you eat a small amount, you get full, and you stop eating. Um, there's also a hormonal component that's not completely understood, but um, the basic uh, me mechanic is the restriction. So you're moving about 70% of the stomach, and the stomach ends up being shaped more like a tube at the end of this. It's a much more straightforward procedure than, than the bypass, and everything stays where it was originally, it's just now the stomach is a much smaller um, passage. So there's no malabsorption. It's still important to take one's vitamins for the long term, um, because with eating less, you're not necessarily getting all the same nutrients that you were before. Um, so that's still an important thing. And, and for either procedure, we routinely check labs more often early on, and then it can space out later once a person's, um, once we're sure that they're getting enough. Um, this has on average slightly less excess weight loss than the bypass, so 40 to 60%. But with, with the procedures, it's, these are just averages. So it doesn't necessarily correlate to the individual. Um, you could have a person that is losing more weight with a sleeve than with a bypass. So I don't want to give the perception that um, the sleeve is necessarily an inferior procedure. It's, it's more what just happens with the, with the procedure afterwards. Um, this has become the most common procedure in the United States. Um, so about 70% of procedures are the sleeve at this point. I think uh, it's important that Dr. Stafford was saying, you know, we try to, you know, meet our patients and try to so fit the best operation for our patient. It's important that we do that, uh, that we really try to figure out what the patient's needs are and make sure we fit the right operation for the right patient. I think that's something that we are proud of in terms of our program. And speaking of, uh, the right procedure for Lynn was the sleeve. Lynn, thanks for being patient and, uh, and watching through these slides. So excited to hear from you. So we've got uh, some information that you had passed along, uh, what your condition was like, what made you decide to do this. So, so tell us in your own words, uh, what life was like for you five, five and a half years ago when you first uh, met the staff. Okay, so I'm 34 years old now. Uh, and I have two children. So my son is eight years old and I got pregnant with him without any uh, assistance, but I had pre-existing conditions being pregnant with him. So I have had chronic high blood pressure since I was 20 years old. And uh, unfortunately, genetically, it's in my family. 
Um, so even with different modifications, I couldn't change the fact that I still had high blood pressure. So I had my son and then come time, my husband and I wanted to try to have another baby and I was not able to. So the chronic weight, the hypertension um, was definitely a factor. I also had underlying metabolic problems with my periods and my um, infertility was starting to come out. So I got diagnosed with secondary infertility. I wasn't able to conceive. Um, so I started to see a specialist for my menstrual cycle. And I do have polycystic ovarian syndrome in which I have had you know, before my first son. And um, while I was going through um, my infertility, it was my, my infertility doctor who had diagnosed me with um, a newly onset diabetes. So that was the big changing point for me to look at the whole big picture. Um, it just wasn't about getting pregnant. It was, okay, my body now is giving me the red flag something is going wrong metabolically. And like Dr. V and Dr. Stafford had explained, um, it's more to the picture than just weight loss. So um, even though my weight was, uh, my BMI was, was high, um, it wouldn't have qualified me through my insurance um, because it wasn't high enough. But what happened was I had more than one underlying diagnosed um, chronic conditions. So I had high blood pressure. Um, I managed that on, on medication and I was a newly diagnosed diabetic and I had to start a medication called metformin. Um, and I also had to take infertility uh, treatments. So that started the, the um, picture. And even with fertility treatments, um, my husband and I still couldn't get pregnant after three years. So I stopped and I looked at the big picture. And that's when my journey of weight loss surgery began after I looked at the whole picture of why is this all happening to me? So those to me were my signs. This is gonna be my journey. This is gonna be my pathway. I need to explore bariatric surgery. And Dr. V, she came in, um, every patient is different. Why was Lynn a good fit and um, what was it, your, your conversation like when you first saw her and, and advice that you gave her? I, I think, you know, we um, talked about bypass and sleeve. I think we, we maybe even changed some of our uh, options as time went on. And that is important uh, that we work with our patients in terms of what their likes are too. So, and, and depending on what they want to do, I think one of the things that Lynn uh, wanted to do was to have a, another child. And I think uh, doing a bypass, because there was some concerns about vitamin uh, soon after surgery. And if you want to have a baby uh, with a, after two years, you know, it's a little bit easier to, to do the sleeve and manage that. Um, but, you know, for the, there are people who have bypass and have really healthy babies. And it's, it's, it is very possible. And sometimes that's the only way that people are able to have babies is to keep their weights under control. I think what's important here is the Len really step back and look at the big picture, right? It was not about the weight. You know, it was the weight that was bringing on all these things, blood pressure, diabetes, uh, not being able to conceive. So when you look at it, obesity is a, is a bigger sort of the, um, of pulling force that brings all these medical illness uh, second to smoking. And we really, it's a epidemic. We are in, a, in a midst of a pandemic, but we are really living through an epidemic of obesity. And the sooner we understand that it is a medical condition and surgery has the most success in terms of addressing obesity, meaning at least 80 to 100 pounds over your uh, ideal body weight, faster we can actually address some of these uh, chronic conditions. So I think that's what uh, Lynn did. And we really worked with her in terms of what the best procedure was for her. So post-surgery, we kind of let the cat out of the bag, Lynn, about your, uh, your daughter, which is great news, but, but here are some of the other things. Um, Lynn, why don't you, as a nurse, take us through this from, from a medical standpoint, what, uh, you were able to, uh, to, to move through and, and, and put behind you. Okay, 
So, like I had mentioned, unfortunately, I had um, high blood pressure since the age of 20, in which I started medications because other um, factors and modifications didn't control my blood pressure the way that we would hope it was. So um, my hypertension is well controlled and unfortunately I still do take medication. I'm on the smallest amount of medication possible and it is actually half the medication of what I was taking before. And at some point, even during my pregnancy, I was pulled off my blood pressure medication because my blood pressure was actually too low. So my um, hypertension or my high blood pressure is well controlled and um, I also, you know, followed up with my physician to make sure there wasn't anything else causing my blood pressure, even with the weight loss. So unfortunately, I still do have chronic hypertension, but it's very well controlled, and I take the smallest amount of medication just once a day. Um, the next biggest thing was my diabetes. So to get diagnosed with type 2 um, non-insulin dependent diabetes at the age of 30 was shocking. Um, I cried for days and I know the effects of what uncontrolled diabetes can do on people because I've cared for those patients because I'm a nurse. I'm also an educator. So I know how important it is to control your underlying diseases. And I know diabetes can cause um, a form of visual problems and blindness. I know diabetes can cause um, amputated limbs delayed healing. I know diabetes can cause kidney failure that could end up um, needing dialysis. So there's a lot of things that scare me about diabetes because I've seen it with my patients and even young patients who have these complications of diabetes. So for me to get diagnosed at age 30, uh, being a diabetic was very scary. It was very scary and that, like I had said, was my turning point. That, that was my red flag something needed to be done. And um, I've been married for 10 years to my husband and I met him in high school. So we were high school sweethearts and he's been throughout my whole journey. So he has seen the struggles that I've had with my weight since I dated him. It wasn't just, I started to gain the weight when I got pregnant um, metabolically. It was always something was, was happening inside me. Uh, regardless of all the other things that I had tried. And I had tried different things over the course of, of the years. So um, I am very happy to say I was on, well, at that point I was on metformin, which is a type of medication. I was on a thousand milligrams twice a day, which is a lot. And um, I don't take it anymore. I don't take any diabetes medication anymore. And my diabetes um, doesn't in fact go away. Um, it does become dormant which means it kind of went to sleep. So it went away, it's still hiding. So if I find myself getting into those old habits, or if I find my weight starting to get back up and changing um, things that got me into that first place, a lot of diet modifications, that diabetes can kind of roar its, its ugly face to me again. And, and I really have to make sure uh, you know, like Dr. Stafford and Dr. V had mentioned, that it's not an easy fix. And every day you need to, um, you need to think about what you're going to eat because these secondary things that come on, like your blood pressure and your hypertension because of, uh, and diabetes because of the, <clears throat> the weight, um, doesn't go away 100%. Nothing does, right? So we have to make sure that we take care of it. But right now, um, we're, I'm in an excellent place that I'm not considered a diabetic. I'm proud to say that I'm not a diabetic. I'm on no medication for diabetes and my um, blood levels uh, prove that I am not pre-diabetic neither. So that's uh, something really important to me is that I had resolved that. My periods are now regular, which is great as well. Um, uh, I don't plan on having any more children. Um, but um, my hormonal balance definitely was corrected with my underlying polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I was able to sustain a full-term pregnancy to my daughter. So now I have a daughter and a son. She's 28 months old. So um, unfortunately, I still couldn't get pregnant 
naturally. So I did need assistance uh, via um, in vitro. So I um, uh, still had a successful pregnancy. Of course, I had to wait until it was safe uh, for for me to become pregnant, even though I was very anxious to get pregnant because I had lost the weight, I wanted to make sure that my body still was healthy. So I uh, waited till I got the okay and the clearance from my bariatric team to start the treatment and become pregnant. So um, that, you know, um, Pete knows I call that my non-scale victory. So yes, it's, it's great that we lose the weight but really my non-scale victory is uh, my beautiful, healthy, 28-month-old wild daughter. And um, I'm no longer considered diabetes and I don't have to say that now when I'm asked for a past medical history. So I'm proud to say a lot of my underlying uh, metabolic conditions have either been corrected or um, have been uh, suppressed or, or uh, lowered significantly. And of course, I, I did lose 85 pounds, so that's, uh, that, that's a nice uh, component of it. I do have to say being four and a half years out and also being a mom, um, and I find myself, uh, I did gain 10 to 15 pounds back of my lowest, which is normal. Um, to have some weight gain um, after your lowest. So uh, I, of course, I'm taking control of that and I, um, I watch my nutrition and um, my exercise and I still go to the bariatric office. Um, even though I could go every uh, year, I still like to go see them twice a year because I actually have all my lab work checked and to make sure that my vitamins and all my nutrition is still um, is, is still where it needs to be because sometimes every six months it, it changes based on you know your your diet and, and what's going on in your life and especially during this this crisis time uh, I was afraid to go to my last appointment because I was up ten pounds um, but I know the importance of uh, coming to terms with what is going on and taking control. Control is very important and still meeting with your team because um, the team is very supportive and it is a team. It's a comprehensive team of many, many people. So it's not just the doctors or, or what's going to fix you and it's not a fix. It's a tool. It's the whole team. It's the whole support that you get uh, from the team. And it's definitely a journey. It's, uh, it, it, it didn't happen overnight. This didn't happen overnight. I, I don't look like this. Uh, overnight. It took time. It took work. It took years. It took diet. It took sadness and tears and family and support. It, 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 was, um, it was definitely a journey and my journey hasn't stopped here. It's continuing and hopefully I can assist you and inspire you to take your journey now because this is the beginning of your journey and I congratulate you for coming to terms as I did and uh, looking at yourself and taking control. And you should be commended on that, being here, getting information and um, starting the process. So congratulations. Lynn, you're a great role model and we'll get back to you with a few questions, but I think um, that segues in nicely to beginning that journey. And, and as we stated before, the team at Brown Surgical and at the Miriam have adapted with the times and Dr. Stafford, I want to ask you how things have changed and, and what it means now to start that journey safely from home. Yeah, yeah certainly this is in a time where people are rushing to get into the hospital or rushing to a doctor's office. So, and, and that's with good reason. Like we all want to try to be as safe as possible. Um, we've, we've implemented a lot more uh, teleconferencing or even phone call visits to try to make it so we can keep um, caring for patients and, and starting a lot of people on this journey. Um, really, right now, it, it, it's never been easier to, to start. Um, you can do many of the initial steps just through phone calls, just from your own house, or um, if you're able to on a computer do a, a video conference. That's not just with the surgeons, that's also with our behavioral psychologists, um, support groups and even our sleep studies are set up at home so you can do 
a large portion of the, like I say, the initial steps just from the safety of your own home. Um, it also hasn't been easier than now from an insurance standpoint. So insurance companies have been waiving copays and um, insurance companies that previously required a referral from a primary care physician, they're not requiring it. So a person can, can sign up and just start with us. Um, there are of course things that need to be done in person later on and, and I know both Dr. Vithyanathan and myself, we want to meet our people before we're operating on them. And, and that will come with time. Um, the whole process usually takes about six months to a year. So it's, um, well, I certainly hope that all this COVID-19 um, is behind us by that point, but it's, it's something where we'd still want to meet with people later. For people that do have to come to the office, we've been, um, really minimizing the people that are in the waiting room. A lot of that's by having people um, wait in their cars and then we'll call them up when the time is, is right for them to come in. Um, so if a person has come to the office, they're usually the only one, the only patient in that office at that time. Like we really wanna maintain social distancing as much as possible. We have people wear masks, we wear masks ourselves because um, we just wanna be as safe as possible. Dr. Vithyanathan, can you speak to it a little bit as well? We've made some changes. I know we talked months ago about some of the telemedicine that, were, that was being developed with the apps and, and ways to keep track of patients. It seems like we were kind of on the brink of instituting some of these policies and, and here they are now, uh, you know, almost overnight uh, when the governor allowed these things to happen. But, but for you, it, it, it certainly made things easier. Yeah, it, it certainly did. I mean, the governor of Rhode Island has really being at the forefront to make sure that the patients did not ignore their health. And you know, most of our patients have been thinking about surgery for two, three years now. So the COVID thing has really put a lot of uncertainty in all of our lives, including ours. But what we have tried in Brown Surgical Associates with our partners at Miriam is to make it easy for our patients to not really require a fancy uh, computer or an app but even pick up your phone and call us to make these appointments. And the, because uh, a lot of the elective surgeries are not being done, there's more flexibility in terms of office time. You know, you can see us in a lot more opportunities to see us. And also, uh, like Dr. Stafford was saying, you can see us from your comfort of your own home for majority of the things, including the uh, dietary visits. And, you know, most of the insurance will require you know, three to six visits to the dietitians and oh, our dietitians, you know, like Lynn was saying, we have comprehensive and collaborative and they've been working hard to have this available in a webinar uh, fashion or, uh, or even one-to-one -one, uh, telephone conferences with you uh, so that it is easy for the patients to do so. And some of us, you know, really don't like the technology to uh, interfere with our, uh, between human beings. And that is also, is possible. I mean, if someone needs to see us in the office, we will see you. And like the, the same principles of social distancing that Dr. Stafford was talking about. And we certainly, you know, we have a lot of other, you know, electronic um, uh, apps and uh, portals that we utilize and we've been, we will be utilizing in the future. So for those who are a lot more savvy about technology, there's opportunities, but sometimes it's a good old fashioned way of meeting the doctor, talking to him, looking him in the eye and saying, you know, this is what my problems are, is what the patients want. And that is available. But the most important thing is like for Len, it took, you know, anywhere from six to 12 months. and with so much uncertainty in life these days, what is certain is obesity, you know, does affect your life. You know, even during COVID, we don't know a lot about, about COVID and his uh, mechanisms of, and how to, there's no cure for it right now. But what we know in patients who are obese did poorly. 
uh, not only in New York, but also in, in uh, Seattle, the studies that come out and said, you know, patients who are obese tend to get sicker faster and people who are even the younger patients who are getting sicker. I mean, we were told only the 70 or 80 year old patients who get sick with COVID, but we found that even the younger patient, the 30 year old who's getting sick and needing the ventilator are the ones who are obese and struggling with obesity related complications. So it is so important for our patients to address it now uh, because it is a lifelong long struggle. And we know uh, this is a, uh, a problem and we need to start addressing it at a time when uh, it is easier to stop this process. And I want to show a <clears throat> picture of the staff. I think, Dr. Stafford, um, we talk often that um, some of the best surgeons anywhere in the entire country are, are right here, literally right here in, in this picture. Um, fellowship trained, you're on the staff at the Medical School at Brown University. Can you talk about the level of experience uh, this team has, for, you know, far out more experience than any, anyone else in the region. Talk about uh, you and some of your colleagues a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a great team of surgeons. Um, um, Dr. Vithyanathan and Dr. Rose, Dr. Ryder, myself, Dr. Lurz, Dr. Georgie. Um, we work really well together. I, I, would, uh, I would let any of them operate on me. It, it's, we have a great deal of trust between our, um, our partners and I think not only just the, the skill at the initial operation, but also availability. Um, we're always available as far as like, if something's going wrong on, on any given night where one of us is available to take care of that issue. Um, and that's not present everywhere. Um, it's, is it, um, is it really just, our, like there are a lot of people that can do these operations around the country. But I, I feel like we have an exceptional group and a system built up around these surgeons. Dr. Vithyanathan, what would you like to add to that? I mean, I, I would, uh, you know, I'm really proud of my team. I mean, um, Dr. Roy, uh, you know, led the team at Rhode Island for 10 to 15 years. Dr. Ryder used to be there, then we merged as one program. and. You know, our surgeons have been trained in really top institutions and, and also trained other surgeons who have gone on to be great surgeons. Now, <clears throat> it's often surgery is linked to the surgeon, but, you know, what is important is the staff. You know, we have Elisa and Christina, who are physician assistants, who are incredible resources for our uh, patients, including our, uh, you know, administrative assistants, our manager. They all sort of work together as a team and we have also a navigator in our office to navigate this long process. You can feel sort of lost in the system. And really that we have someone really walking you through this process. And with our partners at Miriam, you know, the uh, bariatric coordinator uh, in Kelly, you know, who, is, who runs this support group meeting and being available for the questions that uh, that's avail uh, arises anytime I Pediatric dietitians who work really closely with them. And then, uh, you know, as we have um, board certified bariatric medicine doctors and intuitive eating program. So it's not just one thing, the surgery, it is the whole gamut of the care, whether it's pre op, peri op, or post op. Uh, we are there, we realize it's a lifelong struggle, and we want to be there with you. And, and that's, uh, that's our sort of mantra. And we have uh, a lot of questions that have come in. So I wanted to try to get to as many, if, if all, if we can. But uh, Lynn, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation. Um, we had a question that came in actually earlier today about um, someone being curious about how much help is needed in the early days after the procedure. I thought you could speak to this. Uh, this is a, an active patient who's already uh, exercising, walking, and cycling. Um, how, much, how much support is needed and how much is there from, a, from someone who's gone through it? Well, so uh, we're all in a different, unique situation. And what I can say as far as support, it, it definitely, it takes a village. It takes a village. And the village doesn't necessarily need to be 
the village uh, that you're home with, the village can include other support people. So my village included, um, of course, my husband at home. And right when I got discharged from the hospital, I started cooking food. And everyone was looking at me, well, why are you going to cook food? You can't even eat that food because you're on clear liquids as far, part of the first phase of the diet. I said, well, I am still a mother and I can still function. So I still need to make sure my husband and my son eat. Um, so that was definitely uh, challenging, but um, I still had to be the role of what I had to be at home and, and be the mom, the, the spouse, and, and cook. So cooking, it, I didn't really find it difficult. And, you know, sometimes it was a little bit difficult when I sat at the meal uh, table with them and they were eating and I was drinking my fluids and uh, enjoying my fluids and they were eating. But it was more conversational at the dinner table and socialization. So that was definitely um, <clears throat> interesting and, and challenging. So I, I got a lot of support from my family. My son at the time was, was younger. So when I did become um, a actively involved, he oftentimes uh, came with me. He came with me to the gym or he was outside with me. So we were finding things to do together. So I didn't push him away and say, it's mommy time, I need to go work out because I wanna make sure that I'm showing him the right steps on how to change his lifestyle because it isn't a diet, it's, it's in fact a tool. So you have to change many factors about it and not just the eating. So he often came with me to the gym or did workouts with me at home um, or we were outside doing more things because he was also very active being four or five years old at the time. Uh, my best friend is also a fitness competitor and, and a trainer. So she coached me as, um, as a friend and also as a, a, a personal trainer on things that I should and should not do and, and what could be my best. A lot of times we worked out together. We even took a girl's trip to uh, Miami and uh, we had to run along the beach, which was sad, <laughs> and do a whole bunch of other things too. But, uh, you know, it, it was fun. So she was part of my team as well. Of course, my family, my friends at work were part of my team because I eat with them. So they understand, you know, what I can and cannot eat and they're very respectful of that. And they don't take out, you know, all these foods that uh, they know may trigger uh, me to sneak something in here and there. So, um, so my family, my friends, and then I had a lot of support from the, the group itself. The meetings, I still attend um, the meetings to, to help support other people. Um, I know people just outside of here, uh, some people that I've worked with, some people that I've met. Um, out in the public who, who learn about my story. And hopefully if, if I can help somebody along in the process, uh, that's part of my journey of where I am too. So the support comes from, from many, many people, but you have to um, find that support. And it may just not be the people that you're around at home. It's, it's the team that you're involved in, like um, Dr. with Jonathan and Dr. Stafford is speaking of. Great, and uh, we had a few technical difficulties getting onto Facebook earlier today. Uh, so we're on live now, just in case uh, you're joining us, feel free to send in your questions. We're going through kind of a, a whole list of them now. I've got an easy one for you, Dr. Stafford, that came in. Is there a copay for a televisit? So currently there is not a copay. Um, as of right now, that, that situation goes until the end of the month. I think uh, May 28th is the last day where that's um, applicable, but right now, yeah, there's no copay, so that's it. Just makes it that much better to start now. Great, and it looks like through the the 28th, I think, is the date. Yeah, May 28th, right. and um, we get updated daily by the governor. Doctor V, question for you that came in: How is BSA Brown Surgical Associates handling social distancing protocols? And I that would relate, I, I would imagine, to office visits. Yeah, I think Dr. Stafford uh, was speaking to that a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, people that come to our office realize that <laughs> our office is pretty crowded, uh, usually. Uh, so we have realized that we cannot practice that way in, in this uncertain times. 
So uh, what we have done is, you know, make sure that everybody wears masks. We sort of bring one person at a time and you, you're usually coming in, you know, sort of hanging out in the path parking lot and you're allowed to come in when, you, when it's your turn. So you're really not, you know, congregating in a crowded uh, office and, and you're sort of walking in and walking out, you probably will not see a single patient while you're in, in and out of it. And the other issue of social distancing is the televisits. I mean, majority of our patients actually prefer um, to have our visits uh, on the, uh, either via video or telephone so that they can be comfortable at home. You know, a lot of us have childcare responsibilities, kids at home. So you can do that you can be at home, be supportive of your family and take care of your health. And I think that is, I think is very crucial. And, and I really uh, uh, proud of our team to sort of adapt that uh, approach so that you can be safe, uh, be at home. I'll better answer that question. And another question that came in, where do the surgeries take place, Dr. Stafford? All of our um, elective scheduled cases are taking place at Miriam Hospital. Um, because of our affiliation also with Rhode Island Hospital, um, because Brown Surgical Associates cover both hospitals, if there was an emergency case, potentially we would do it around, but the vast majority of cases are done at Miriam Hospital. And for those that don't know, Miriam is a center of excellence. Just today, um, hours ago, uh, I read the news that it, uh, another grade A from LeapFrog. Uh, Dr. V, talk about that and, and how uh, proud you are of that uh, hospital and, and what you've built there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the Miriam really, uh, it's a great partnership of two different systems, right? You know, the Brown Surgical Associates, one of the premier groups in New England and Miriam Hospital, you know, and Rhode Island Hospital, part of Lifespan, being the really the leaders of healthcare in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. But Miriam, I mean, I, I'm really, I mean, I've worked in different systems in my career, and I will tell you, hands down, is the best hospital I've worked in. Why? You know, it's not, it's not the surgeon's experience as a surgeon working there. I mean, people, well, I can honestly tell you that people want to help the patient, no matter what what you are, it, it starts from the person who greets you in the front door to the person who puts you to sleep in the, in, in the anesthesia for anesthesiologists to the person who, you know, cleans the floor. Everybody is really working towards the same goal. And that is something that it's hard to see in these days in hospitals. So that is sort of a personal experience. Now, if you look at accolades, I mean, we are a center of excellence, like you said, we are accredited by uh, American College of Surgeons to provide bariatric surgery for adults and adolescents. Again, this is the honor that we have. In a couple of, couple of uh, uh, rounds, we were up for renewal this year and we were going for obesity medicine certification as well, but with the, due to COVID-19, that's been delayed. In addition to that, we have the experts in, you know, certified uh, uh, experts in obesity medicine who can be there for before and after care when people are having some trouble, we, you know, they're there to help you. We also work closely with behavioral medicine. It's one of the top programs in the country uh, who are the behavioral medicine folks. That's at Miriam. Miriam did not start to care for a patient struggling with obesity just recently. They've been doing this for decades, well before I came to town. So this is part and part of parcel of their composition, you know, to take care of patients who are normally ignored by the rest of the healthcare system. <clears throat> and so this is something they're passionate about. You now we have the best nurses. I mean, we are one of the only institutions at Miriam that have long, won the six uh, in a row, uh, not six, a recognition in a row for magnet certification. That's an honor that only one other hospital has in, in the country. We have leapfrog certified, we health grades, we have the top hospital. I mean, this goes on and on. But I know I work here, my patients know, you know, we are the best hospital. I mean, it cannot, I cannot say any, uh, anything, anything, anything about, uh, bad about Miriam. And Lynn, uh, as a patient who's gone through it there, tell, tell us your thoughts. So 
my my um, experience was a bit unique, um, being a nurse uh, and and caring for uh, you know critically ill patients. So my background is in critical care, uh, ICU nursing. So um, uh, so as a nurse, I, I know um, what can what can happen and how important it is to take care of yourself. So I was initially very nervous to go through the whole process. I think a lot of it stemmed from embarrassment. I was really embarrassed with myself and I did, it took me a while to come to terms with, um, I'm struggling and I, and I need help and I'm a very proud person. And uh, having these medical problems was, was very difficult to me. So I remember attending the first meeting at the Miriam. It was an informational seminar and um, I sat in the front. I don't know why I sat in the front. And um, I remember hearing the stories and the stories were so inspirational. And um, Kelly herself is, is a weight loss um, survivor. So she has, a, you know, she's the coordinator, she's the nurse coordinator for it. So she has a very personal story herself. And the stories that I heard at the informational seminar was, was very intriguing. So that started the ease of the process. And then um, when I started to meet the, the dietitians and the support staff and the psychologist and um, go along and get all my testing. It just, just the whole process was easy. It was, um, it made me feel uh, productive that I was getting to check off and give you a whole checklist on the first day of your meeting because that's your first step. And you can check that off. And then the next check, you can check off. You did this, you have this and, uh, as the checks go on, the process, the journey becomes more real, and uh, it was easy. And, and I think what, what is really unique about the program is the bedside um, mannerisms of the staff. And, uh, you know, I, I brought my, my son to my visits all the time, and, and Dr. V, he not only cared for me as his bariatric patient, but he always made sure he was quite conversational with my son and, and you know, made him a little glove balloon and my son still talks about it and asks about him all the time. So I think the bedside mannerisms of, of the staff is, is very important and it made me feel very easy to come to the staff. And sometimes, you know, I don't, I may not see uh, <clears throat> Dr. V, but I get to see the whole team which is great, and, and maybe in another experience, I might say, no, I only want to see him. He's my surgeon. I feel confident. I, I feel very comfortable seeing everyone in the whole team because they are a whole team, and it really put an ease on me as a patient, um, as a patient perspective. The, the process was still easy, and, that, and that's why maybe I can still kind of go see him twice a year. <laughs> great answer. Must feel good to hear that, Dr. V. Uh, Dr. Stafford, we had a question come in about someone who had had surgery uh, many years ago that has regained weight. What is your advice on that? Yeah, I, it's, it's important to come back to the office or have a conversation with us, just trying to get reestablished. Um, even that aspect of touching base again, um, it really can be encouraging for patients to start making those good changes again. Very often the people know the right things to do at that point, but it's um, it's just getting that support system back in place. We also have strong affiliations with um, uh, Dr. Bodkin, for instance, her program, Intuitive Eating. And a lot of people are finding that that can be a very helpful um, adjunct to, to their post-op care. Um, some people, don't want to come back because they, they almost feel like, like they would be judged if, oh, I gained 20 pounds back. My surgeon's not going to want to talk to me or he's going to be ashamed of me or something. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we want to be able to help people get back on track. We want people to be healthy. That's why we are in this business to get people healthier. Um, so as far as like the, the details of, do this, do that. It, it's not as much about that. It's more just getting back in the system. Great. Dr. V, anything to add to that one? No, I think that's, uh, that's exactly what we do. Um, question that we've kind of covered a little bit, but it comes up all the time. When will elective surgeries uh, be coming back? And uh, it's a tough question. 
I don't have my crystal ball. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, these days, and uh, we really, you know, share that with our patients. Uh, the good news today, uh, as you know, Pete, uh, the governor announced that we can do elective surgery on May the 11th, that's next Monday. Uh, that is not for bariatric surgery. This is for elective surgeries that people can have and go home the same day. So bariatric surgery will be in the third phase of when we start surgery. And we wanna make sure that, you know, we can take care of our patients in a safe environment. And, uh, and the environment, when they come out of the, the safe social distancing that, you know, we wanna make sure the infection's under control. So there's a lot of different things that we are looking for uh, in order to monitor that. And it's certainly something that the governor, the Department of Health, the uh, hospital leadership, they're all working together to make sure that we offer services in a safe fashion. So right now, I don't have a right an direct answer, but we're hoping, we are optimistic because of the elective surgery starting next week. We are, we are very optimistic. Great. Um, we had another question come in about how long the process is. We've, we've covered it a little bit, but um, Lynn, as, as a patient for the process, how long was the process for you? When did you start thinking about it and how long uh, it, would you say the process is? So specifically the process uh, through their program was seven months for me, but it began uh, uh, ruminating in my head years previous to. Um, <clears throat> so like I had mentioned, it was kind of in my head knowing genetically what I have in my family history and already starting with pre-existing conditions. So I knew about bariatric surgery being a registered nurse and caring for bariatric uh, patients, but I never really considered myself a bariatric person. Uh, maybe because my, my weight wasn't as high, but what I had mentioned, when my body was giving me the red flags that something metabolically was going wrong, I looked at myself differently. And um, the years that I had thought maybe I should probably uh, have done this and, and was embarrassed with myself and really didn't come to terms with it uh, was, was the years before. But the specific uh, first step in the process was seven months specifically for me um, going through all the requirements that, that were needed based on that pathway that you had discussed earlier um, for, for your, your, your pre-op um, pre visits and um, your pre-authorizations and so forth, which uh, now is, is easier than ever because of uh, the, the pandemic. So. And for those just joining us, um, one of the highlights of this is that the, the journey can begin at home right now uh, as quickly as, well, Dr. Saver, how quickly could someone begin this process? That was another question that came in. How, uh, how long does someone have to wait for a consult? Yeah, so um, a lot of people can start even within a week. So there is an uh, in, intake form with different patient information that we like to get, and that usually helps us get people in faster. Um, but even if that's something that can't be done beforehand, it, even then it's only about two weeks before we can get in touch, uh, in touch with the person. So one to two weeks, fairly fast. Great. And going through some of these questions about, uh, again, congratulations on Miriam Hospital. Anything else, Dr. V, that, um, you would let a patient know about who's considering this, who's at home right now, um, maybe feeling a little bit complacent? I think one of the um, couple of things that I think people are worried about, I think Lynn did uh, talk about this. I think one of the things, the misconceptions is what is the diet going to be like? And what is kind of recovery am I going to be looking at, right? Uh, these are questions that uh, need to be answered because there's some misconceptions. All the operations that we are doing are laparoscopic, or minimally invasive, small incision. The pain is not a big concern for a lot of our patients. However, you know, because there's a transition from sort of a mushy food to regular food over the next 
few weeks, you know, people have to sort of pay a little extra attention in their eating and exercise. So we typically say, you know, it may take about a month to six weeks for you to feel normal. Okay. Now, m many of them will take that time off from work about four weeks. Uh, but recovery, you know, we really, even though we are really doing this operation that divides the stomach and reroutes sometimes, people go home in a day or two. I mean, this is a remarkable um, uh, system that we have in place and the patients are motivated and they know exactly um, what to do because we are spending that seven month period to preparing you for that journey. It's like a marathon, right? You don't roll out of bed and run, you know, you prepare for it. And that's what we are spending this time. And some of that is really determined by insurance. So in someone's having three months, the other one's having six months, it's really not my rule. It's the, uh, the insurance companies have different rules. So, but we are using that time to really prepare our patients. So it is a misconception to say, I'm only going to be on mushy food or liquid food for the rest of my life. That's not true. You're going to be eating like anybody else, regular but healthy food. The other, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So, so those changes are important, but that's one of our, the dietitians, we have really incredible dietitians who would teach you how to cook healthy, to show you where to shop and how to shop and how to get your healthy food prepared. Um, so it's, it's a whole concept and the recovery is based on how you incorporate that. And most of us will tell us, this is the, the other thing, Will say that they'll tell us, you know, I wish I had done it five years ago or 10 years ago when they completed it. Because they have been, most of our patients have been thinking about it for three years or four years before they actually come to us because of fear. Fear of society judging them. Fear of themselves judging them. And really, you have to look at surgery as a treatment. We don't say a cancer patient who has been smoking and say, you know, you deserve cancer and you should not be treated. We treat our patients, right? Same thing with obesity. It's a metabolic disease. It's not a behavioral problem. Uh, so we have to treat our patients. And sooner you get on this journey, sooner you get on, you know, you know get to a normal life. And uh, so that's what our patient will tell us. You know, without fail, they'll tell us, I wish I had done it earlier. Lynn, is that how you feel? And, and uh, if you could speak to the, the food, which is a big question that, I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking about. Yeah, so like, like you know, um, Dr. V had mentioned, and I do wish I had done it earlier. And I had my surgery when I was 30 years old. And I was a young patient, uh, being 30 years old, having bariatric surgery. And if I look back, seeing how my journey has been, I wish I did it when I was in my early 20s, before really um, things really started to kind of, grew inside of me that that took years to come out so yeah i totally agree i wish i i had done it a, a long time ago but i think a lot of it was also some misconceptions that i felt even you know um <clears throat> being in the field in, in the medical field uh, especially for for embarrassment so if if i can help and, and support you i'm glad you're here today so a big question is is food right so I have two children, I have a picky toddler, I have an eight-year-old boy, and I have a very thin husband who's 150 pounds, who can eat whatever he wants and never gain an ounce. And he's been like that forever. So what does my meals look like? So I'll actually tell you what I ate today, because um, typically that's, that's a question. So for breakfast, they all had cereal, <laughs> uh, and I had a yogurt. And then I had half of a banana later on for a snack, for um, lunch, my son made a pizza, and I had grilled chicken that my mom had cooked. My mom is Syrian, so she cooked really good garlicky chicken. So I took some from her house. So I had some chicken, I had some salad, and I had hummus. So um, I had some hummus later on. I had for a snack some hummus and some cucumbers, and I had my protein shake that was pre-made um, to get my protein in. And for dinner, um, I had chicken, and I haven't eaten anything um, due for a snack before I go to bed, so I'll probably pick up a fruit 
um, or, or um, a cheese stick or something. So what's really important is uh, choosing the better options of food. So even though I'm cooking for my family, if I'm making a pasta dish, I have substituted what I use for pasta. So I have become to love zoodles, zucchini noodles, and I've come to love spaghetti squash. And at first I would never even put that near me. Like that's disgusting. Uh, vegetables, I hated vegetables growing up. I always felt like my mom tried to feed me vegetables. Um, but um, going through the surgery and going through the process of uh, starting to wean into your food of liquids and soft and pureed, your taste buds actually changed and things that I thought I was gonna crave and miss, um, I didn't. And when I kind of snuck a bite, um, I, was, I was dissatisfied. I was like, well, I don't, I don't want that. I don't, it, it's not something that I feel I want to eat. I don't eat um, bread really. It makes me feel uncomfortable uh, because of my restriction. It almost makes me feel, even if I chew it a lot, I, if I feel like it gets stuck. Uh, so I don't, I didn't, haven't resorted back to bread. I haven't really introduced pasta back in my life anymore because I've made those alternative substitutions for pasta. Um, the, the problem that I do have, which a lot of patients probably will also speak about, is um, dehydration. So it's important that um, you probably saw that I was drinking. I always have water or some kind of fluid with me because in the first six weeks after my surgery, I did in fact become dehydrated because it's very quick for you to become dehydrated um, because you forget to drink and you can't drink as fast as what you normally could. So <laughs> for me, uh, Drinking is very important and I bring water everywhere I go. Uh, so that was kind of what I ate today. And uh, like I said, I still cook the same things that my family will still eat, but I make slight modifications for myself. I don't cook a whole separate meal. And remember how much less I'm eating. So what I cook, I put away and I can eat over the course of three or four days. And my one meal is now three to four days. So you're saving money because you're cooking so much less for yourself. So that, that's also a huge benefit um, for, for your eating specifically. So it's definitely not a diet. Here and there I, I sneak things and I don't completely eliminate it from my diet. Um, but uh, you have made the change to understand what's important and, and what does my body need? Does it need that or does it want it? Well, both, right? It doesn't really need it, but it wants it. So a little in moderation, but again, it's very important for you to, um, to write it down, have the support and uh, make sure the education is very important. And we are drilled before we have the surgery. What can you eat? What is your first phase of this? When do you transition to the next phase? And, and we're really educated to know how to care for ourselves. So even if, Patients are finding themselves gaining weight five, 10 years out, you know, like Dr. Stafford had said, it's very important for you to go back, to go back. Because maybe you forgot about the education or you forgot about the important key things that you learned early on, how to use your tool, right? How to use it and, and what's important of, of eating. So you've got to get back and, and get that support and, and maybe get that education. And, and that's okay to do because um, even I needed that. Uh, four and a half years out, I had to go back. I was actually looking for my papers of um, what's what's more nutritious than than others, so I can uh, manipulate my diet a little bit to to jumpstart my last 10, 15 pounds to get me back where I was. Yeah, we've got a few other questions coming in. In case you're just joining us, we're talking about beginning your weight loss journey, uh, really right now from home during COVID nineteen, as this program can begin virtually through telemedicine. Some of the questions, uh, Dr. Stafford, some quick ones that just came in. Again, uh, people who are just tuning in, when can they have, expect to have surgery? Um, and, and on top of this, someone who uh, said they're having, they might have issues with the liquid diet. Uh, what, what's your advice for getting used to that? Or, or, or um, kind of, would they go to a dietitian or is that something you can speak to? Um, it's right. So as far as when surgeries are going to happen, um, on, uh, so I'll, I'll speak to that in two different ways. So usually the process to get to surgery is about six to 12 months. Um, and that's very um, variable depending on the insurance that one person has. 
Some people it's faster, some people it's slower. And even aside from insurance, people have different medical conditions. So if this person needs a stress test and this person does not, that changes the time frame for that preoperative phase. Um, as far as when we're going to be performing these surgeries from like a COVID-19 standpoint, um, it'll, it'll probably be, uh, I, I would say six months, or sorry, six, six weeks to two months, but I also don't have a crystal ball uh, like Dr. Vithyanathan does not as well. Um, so we'll just see as time goes on, we see what changes are made as far as the, the levels of COVID-19 patients in the hospital and what units are open. That'll really play into um, how we can safely start doing bariatric surgery again. Um, as far as the liquid diet goes, it's, we, often do a liquid diet preoperatively for the two weeks leading up to surgery. Um, and it's not something where if this person doesn't follow this liquid diet, exactly we're going to cancel their operation. But we do the liquid diet to try to make the operation safer. So the, the liquid diet beforehand tends to shrink up the liver. It can make visualization of the stomach better. Um, so it makes the operation safer for one, but it also helps people just sort of get in that mode. They get used to um, just drinking their calories and not having the, the bowl of pasta or whatever it is. Um, Cause it can be a tough transition if you're just eating normally and then you have surgery and then boom, now all of a sudden you're doing liquids and then purees for another six weeks. So it does help ease people in when it's not required. Um, after surgery, if a person tried to eat a solid meal very early, they wouldn't feel well. Like today would be uncomfortable. They probably vomited up. So it's not, um, it's not anything aside from, we just want people to feel well, um, after surgery. And that's what they tolerate. They tolerate liquids. They tolerate purees. Um, it, it is a tough, tough transition though. And I, I would be lying if I said it was otherwise, but. We just try to really work with people to, to support them. I can um, add on to what Dr. Stafford had said as far as the liquid, because that was one of my fears too. How am I going to drink and, and not eat? What do you mean drink and not eat? So um, <clears throat> your stomach actually didn't even growl. So I had to put a timer on my phone to make sure that uh, I ate or drank at a certain time because after the surgery and what the surgery does to, uh, to, to the anatomy of you, for whatever reason, um, for me, it, it, my stomach did not growl. It didn't make the, the sound, the, the, the feeling that I was hungry. So I actually had to put in my phone and I had to remind myself that, hey, you know, now is the time to eat uh, or drink. So really the drinking and the liquid diet that that is a big fear for a lot of people. Uh, it's very manageable. And you, you may not think of it right now. And, and like Dr. Stafford said, preoperatively before, it's important so you can have a safer procedure so they can, they can see better. But it's really not as bad as, as what you uh, may envision. And also the support groups that we have online, uh, we get to share a lot of ways for you to get in your liquids. And what we personally prefer, we don't work for anyone. We don't have any endorsements for anyone to promote, you know, this product over that. And I'll tell you, some people rant and rave over one product. I tried it. It was disgusting, you know. So it's a very personal personal choice, and it's not as bad as what you may think. Great. Um, one thought I had is uh, we've got many questions about when will surgery come back. Dr. V, can you maybe explain a little bit why things are Put off and how safety is the top priority. I think that's probably important for people to understand. Yeah. I mean, I, I can uh, expand on that. I mean, you know, as we said earlier, for those who were just sort of signed on, you know, obesity is one of the risk factors for getting sick from COVID. All right. People who are younger, if you're getting sicker and may need a ventilator, that we have noticed. Uh, from our United States data and also in the world data, people are obese uh, or overwhelmingly at risk. Okay. So that's one of the, you know, our patients, if you are having bariatric surgery, we just don't want to put you at risk inviting you to come into the hospital. 
The other issue is, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the hospital has the capacity to take care of pandemic patients. So, and so we certainly don't want to mix the patients who are sick with the pandemic and who are having elective surgery. So we really want to be safe about that. And we absolutely want to be safe about that. So that is something that the, uh, everyone is very, very focused on. So that those are, so we need to make sure there is a, a decrease in infection in COVID for about two weeks, you know, straight. And then when we open up elective surgery, which is simple surgeries that we do, like go home the same day, we want to make sure that did not change the sort of the balance that we are keeping. And when people are beginning to start some normalcy, you know, there is a tendency that you can have another peak, uh, a, 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 a spike in infection that again would put our patients at risk. So it is a, it's a fine balance with a lot of moving components. We certainly don't want to put someone who's struggling with obesity long-term and put them in an acute crisis. So safety is number one. I mean, that is important for us. And that is, uh, that is something that we really want to be first and foremost and everything else uh, second. Uh, so that's why the date of surgery has a lot of uh, important considerations uh, before we would open up for bariatric surgery. That's why the Miriam's rank so high, right? Yes. Continually. Uh, so I think this has been a great discussion. I think we'd like to go around and, and get some final thoughts from each of you. Lynn, we'll finish with you because you've always got some inspirational things to say. Look, Dr. Stafford, I think uh, for, for anyone watching that may watch now, we'll also post this later online. Um, your, your final thoughts on this conversation. I think that even if a person isn't quite ready to say, yes, I want to do this, I, I think even just um, reaching out to the office, having any additional questions asked, it's, it would just be very helpful to them. Um, there, there are a lot of people that have been, they've been dealing with it for years and years, and there may be this one particular thing that we didn't address here tonight, but that's really holding them back, and we'd be happy to answer or address that one concern or whatever concerns they have. So I think just reaching out is the important part. Dr. Gathianthan, um, your thoughts, and then what would someone uh, do to take that first step? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we don't want to put barriers for care. I mean, our patients who have obesity and obesity-related companies, that's what they're you know, encountering every day. The obese, you know, people don't like you in the office. You know, you're not seen for us. You know, your gowns don't fit. Everything is a problem, right? When you come to office, we don't want to have that issue for you. We address those concerns. We want you to be comfortable. We want you to take your time to get through the process. There's no, it's not like you get in and you have to do the operation. You know, we want you to take the, pro it, it is a long process. We want you to start. And then based on your comfort and how you want to, we would adjust according to your comfort level. And it's important because the insurance plays a big role here. And, and sometimes they are sort of punitive when you don't go through so dietary consults every month. They would say, you know what, you miss a, a month here and we don't want to do this. You had to go back to the line again and restart it. So that's why I think it's important to start and continue the journey. Let's say you get approved for insurance in October. You can hold off on surgery based on your schedule and your concerns. We can do this in January, but it's important to get through those steps. So it's important to consider that. The other issue I you know we didn't address it here is, you know, what is the age? Is that an age cutoff? I mean, you know, like I mentioned before, we are a program for adults and adolescents. So, uh, so Dr. Renault, who is a really, a, a really incredible pediatric surgeon who is part of our team, is also uh, uh, one of the leaders in adolescent bariatric surgery. So for someone whose children, whose children are struggling with obesity, if you're age 16 and above, we would actually see them to consider 
um, helping them because there's a lot of information out there saying children who are obese will become adults who are obese and really have a significant uh, impairment in terms of health and economics and where they end up in long term. So it's important for us to address that issue as well. So I think it's important to engage. I think it, there's no shame in addressing obesity. There's a huge stigma in society. This is not your fault. You know, this is a metabolic condition. You should feel really uh, 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 use this opportunity when you have a moment to think about things and reflect on things while we're at home with our families. You know, take care of your health. You know, reach out to us and we'll take you through this journey. Great. And, and Lynn, right before we get you, we had one question that came I, th I thought would be important to answer because uh, it, it touches on the kind of the, the cutting edge and the latest technology. We talked about the bypass and sleeve, but they asked what other types of surgery uh, do you perform? And, and, and those aren't the only ones. You, you do keep up on the latest uh, and best yeah. surgeries. Talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, please. So so um, obviously the bypass and sleeve are the ones that are most common. The other operations that we do as a duodenal switch, uh, Dr. Lurz, uh, who uh, trained at uh, Duke University, a leader in duodenal switch, is in our faculty member, and so is Dr. Georgi, who is an expert in endoscopic surgery. So we use uh, open surgery very rarely. We do laparoscopic surgery, we use a robot technology, We'll be using that uh, for not only uh, primary surgery at the beginning, but also some people ha may have a problem with the operation, may need to be revised. And we use these technologies, robotic endoscopic revisions uh, to tighten up the stomachs later on, so someone who may require it, um, and uh, uh, robotic technology as well. So, you know, our surgeons, like you pointed out earlier, Pete, uh, have been trained in the most incredible technology that's out there uh, to perform surgery uh, uh, in a way that is most convenient and comfortable for the patients. <clears throat> it's a safe option and that really changed the outcomes of surgery, in, uh, especially in bariatric surgery. And we are happy to say that we are right at the forefront of that. And not a, you know, we don't want to sound that we have about technology, but we, I think it is a holistic approach it is along with the technology is important and that's what we adapt. Great, thank you. And Lynn, uh, your, your last words of advice, um, we appreciate you taking all this time, two young ones at home and busy schedule. So uh, thanks again for taking the time. What, uh, what's your advice to those who are wa watching now and thinking about uh, weight loss surgery? Well, thank you for having me. And um, <clears throat> so um, again, I'm, I'm happy to share my story because like I said, my, the first meeting, the stories that were shared were very inspirational. And your story may be very similar to my story, or it may be very different. Everybody has their own journey. It's, it's a journey, it's, it's, it's gonna be a process. And um, that's what makes each other very supportive of, of each other in, in this process. So everybody's journey is different. Everyone's um, reasoning is, is different. But we're all here for the same reason. We're all here to achieve success. We're all here to achieve health, right? And um, I congratulate you all for being here during this, this meeting, this seminar, because you're taking charge of your first step. And this is the first process. And um, if nobody else congratulates you, I will congratulate you as another weight loss patient. And it's important for you to, to meet us, maybe not just me, but meet another weight loss patient and ask them, see them, see the real person. We are real people. You know, I'm not made up. I wasn't paid to do this. I'm, I'm here out of my goodwill. And um, I, I hope to inspire someone. And again, uh, congratulations being here on your first step and, and take the next step. Take the next step and begin your journey and, and, and write your journey because your journey is important. That's great. And uh, we have, Lynn's story of a great video on uh, brownsurgicalassociates.org uh, that we did a few years back. So uh, if anyone wants to take a look at that, we've got another great uh, journey with another patient on there as well. Um, and again, we encourage anyone who has any questions to reach out. Uh, we will get back to you soon. We will post this entire uh, webinar online on YouTube as well. Oh, that's right. Let's take a look at that. 
And then and Pete, before we uh, go. Pete, someone actually asked me, texted me saying, can you put the telephone number and the website up? So uh, make sure we share that information. Okay. We will get that up right now. And Lynn, go ahead and show us that again. These are, what are these? These from 2000? I don't even know when they're from. They're old okay. jeans now. <laughs> they're old jeans. They're not even in style anymore. <laughs> but these are my old jeans and I keep them. Why do I keep them? And when I went through all my clothes, because I had to buy new clothes because no clothes fit, I made sure I kept my old jeans to remember where I came from. So essentially my son is eight years old. He's about 70 something pounds. I lost 85 pounds. So I lost more than my son weight and mass is. And I have my old jeans to fit in and show you. Um, you can see the pictures on, on my journey. I'm still using the same jeans. And I keep the jeans with me to help me remember uh, where I was and how different uh, my life is now. So these are my old jeans that I often still keep and show people. <laughs> oh, that's great, congratulations. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you doctors as well. Here is, uh, here's the hotline number 401-793-3922. And again, online, you can also find this information, uh, the Miriam website where uh, the program is run. So uh, again, thank you for all those who reached out with questions and tuned in tonight. We hope uh, you felt this was informative. And again, remember you can begin your journey at home through telemedicine uh, with this program as early as within the next week. Um, and we also wanna remind you that, that Brown Surgical Associates is seeing patients at all locations and online through telemedicine. So uh, if you have concerns, um, they are open and seeing patients as in, in a very safe manner. So we uh, encourage you to be safe. Safety is the top priority. And um, again, we thank you for being with us. If you have any questions, please follow up and we will do our best to get them answered. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night.